Welcome to the Facts vs. Feelings podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Dietrich, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sonu Varghese. Cutting through the noise in 30 minutes each week with Ryan Dietrich, Chief Market Strategist, and Sonu Varghese, VP Global Macro Strategist, taking out the boring and helping investors focus on what really matters. A quick note before we start the show. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC and SEC Registered Investment Advisor, Carson Partners, a division of CWM LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 54 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings with Ryan and Sonu. Sonu, we're titling this one, Welcome to the Fourth Quarter. We were joking. It felt like we haven't done one of these in a while because when we yeah. were in Nashville a few weeks ago, we pre recorded a couple. It's like riding a bike, though. I think we'll be okay. What do you think? I think so. I have a question for you to start off with, and I'm going to put oh, my boy. glasses for this. Uh, <laughs> did you see Did you see Expendables 4 yet? No, I have not seen it yet. I don't <laughs> think anybody, I don't think anyone saw Expendables 4 from what I was hearing. <laughs> did you see it? Did you go no, to it? No. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> My wife is not going to come with me for that stuff. So no, you know. and I've never you know, watched a movie alone. So I I've never gone to the theater so alone. Do. So do I'm in Chicago next week. By the time people listen oh, to this, I yes. wonder if we've got two hours to stink off to a movie. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll see. We'll see. No. That'd be we could do facts versus feelings from the theater because nobody would be there. Like literally, we'd be the only two people in the movie <laughs> yes. for Expendables Four, and we could just do our podcast from there. Oh, that'd be funny. Uh, anyway, uh, all right. Funny. All right. Q4. Why don't you go? Q four is coming co- up. It's coming up. So we're going to talk about that in a second. Today, we are talking about that. We're going to start with government shutdowns, talk a little bit about the fourth quarter, why we think um, a chance for the Bulls to take back the reins is likely. And then we're going to end with some economic data. But by the time, just so everyone knows, Sonu and I are recording this on Friday. Uh, what is today's date? Friday, September 29th. Um, we had to do it early because I'll be in Chicago hanging out with Sonu for a couple of days. And we're assuming by the time you listen to this, the government will have been shut down. If we're wrong, just fast forward about five, six minutes or so. That's okay. Um, you know, Sonu, so let's assume the government shut down by the time people listen to this we don't know if it's a full shutdown we don't know if it's a, a partial shutdown but we know it's probably coming how does that impact the economy i mean what's really going to matter to the listener of this podcast with the government being shut down the most uh, direct impact is obviously a lot of federal employees are not going to get paid and mm-hmm. you think obviously if somebody doesn't get paid what are they going to you know like how are they going to pay for stuff right consumption how does that it the reality is look most uh, government shutdowns even full shutdowns and at some point, I mean, you know, you can go only so many days and weeks without a lot of service members, especially getting paid. And uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Congress to get this thing open. I don't want to say uh, time for Congress to get its act together, because, you know, in another conversation, you said, you know, good luck for the good luck waiting for that. But, yeah. you know, they'll get it open at some point. Right. And at that time, everyone gets back there, gets back paid. Right. And so consumption will. So, and you know, I think it was. Was it Goldman or uh, Ned Davis Research, uh, our friends over there, who said that for every week that the government mm-hmm. is shut down, uh, the economy slows by about 0.1%, right? Yeah. But you think all that is made up, you know, when, you know, people get paid again. So it's almost like if it goes down, it'll come back up by pretty much the same amount. So it's yeah, a temporary we- thing. We talked about that with Alejandra Grindall um, over at Ned Davis mm-hmm. Research, the previous podcast that we recorded. And again, that, that was Ned Davis. And maybe Goldman said the exact same thing. I'll be honest. They're all just kind of spitballing, I think. But the truth is you're taking some away from the economy by shutting the government down. I mean, I, I bought a passport last year. It took a while to get a passport. Good luck getting the passport now, right? There are some some food programs that are saying, you know what? We might run out of money. Uh, all the, some of the super the aid, the b- big time aid is oh. going on in, in Hawaii and other places. They're saying, listen, we might run out of money also. So we have a little bit, but if this government shutdown goes a while, you know, that's one of the, the, the smart people you and I follow that are saying, listen, market gets it. Market's going to take this probably in stride. I got some numbers we'll talk about in a second. But the one wild card is the last government shutdown was like 35 days, right? That was a partial wow. shutdown, but that was a record 35 days. Maybe this goes longer than expected. And so now what does that mean for economic data? And maybe how that falls out to the Fed potentially? The next time we do this, we may be just reading, you know, was it Green Eggs and Ham? Yeah. <laughs> you told me about that. Like Ted Cruz is reading 
green eggs and ham. Yeah, the last <laughs> the time, the, yeah, the last time the government shut down, Ted Cruz graced us with green eggs and ham. I mean, you go look at the Google. I mean, or, or YouTube. It's like I'm like, oh my god, that's right, he did do that. Like that's what happened last time the government shut down because we had no economic data. <laughs> Yeah. So I, you know, I was going to say I may be out of job, but no, yeah. hopefully not. <laughs> but uh, look, if the government shut down, we don't get the first thing is the payroll data for, you know, this week. I mean, you know, this episode comes out Wednesday, Friday, assuming the government still shut down. We don't get payroll data. That's the first economic right. data blow. And then retail sales is the following week. CPI data. We don't get that. And more mm. importantly, uh, the for the Payroll report, the data collection is done during the week of the 15th, October 15th. If the government shut down, that data doesn't get collected. So then you think about the November payroll report. We didn't have data for that, right? So, the, yeah, it all becomes, it sort of snowballs, and we are all going to be hanging in, in a suspended animation for a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially a guy like you, you actually like going through all the economic data. You are going to be bored. You might have to find some other hobby. Uh, maybe get the guitar out or something. But I mean, let's 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 talk a couple more minutes on this. So the government shut down. I'll just here's the numbers. Um, so I want to ask you what it means for the Fed in a second. But there have been 22 other shutdowns according to data I use going back to 1976. The S&P 500 during the shutdown gains 0.3 percent. OK, the median shutdowns about five days. The average is about nine. But. The last one, okay, last time government shut down 35 days, late 2018, early 2019. S&P gained 10.3% during that shutdown. Now, yes, the Fed did the major pivot. So those of us remember late 2018, a horrible mm -hmm. December. Fed did a pivot, um, and that sparked that rally. So, again, it, you know, news trumps charts is something we like to say. And uh, there's definitely some news there. But the reality is a government shutdown likely is not going to be a major, major reason for the, the the stock market to yeah. sell off there might be others don't get me wrong there could be others it's probably not gonna be that the last one though a year so new after all these shutdowns when the government finally opened up and again the government's opened up every time after a shutdown just like the dow has hit a new all-time high every single time since 1896 it's going to happen eventually we're aware it's been a while since all-time high but back to the government a year later the s p is higher 87 or 86 percent of the time ups 12.7 percent average a year after the shutdown's over now I, I get it lots of different things happen in there i guess it's just for investors to remember markets tend to go up they've had bad news before they're gonna have bad news again let's just put this in context now so new final comment let you close the door on this the fed i mean the fed we're gonna talk about uh, some of the economic data you know at the end here but if the Fed has no data, can they really hike rates later this year? Uh, short answer, I don't think so. Yeah. Right? Or, 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 you know, short, shorter answer is probably no. I, shorter I answer is no. No is one no. word. So no, that is the shortest no. answer. The answer is <laughs> yes. no, it's shortest. <laughs> They're not going to raise rates. But, yeah. you know, like you said, we're going to talk about the economic data. <clears throat> the day we are recording this this morning, we got inflation data, consumption, income. It all points to inflation's going down. The economy is strong period. The Fed's not going to raise rates. We've been in that camp for a while. So, yeah. I, and especially if we don't get data. I mean, I think Neil Kashkari, remember him? Mm -hmm. He's still around. He just yeah. wrote an essay. He just wrote that, look, if the government shut down, his perspective is they're kind of doing the, you know, the Fed's work in slowing down the economy. Of course, the other side of it is when it opens up, everything goes back up, right? No. But you know, right. you said news trumps charts. I'd say news trumps government at this point, probably too. So Ooh, there could nice be other way. things, <laughs> other things going on. Yeah, well. I saw saw Dion Sanders, coach of Colorado. He trademarked like five or six different um, sayings recently. Um, you could maybe trademark that one. That news trumps government. I don't think anyone has a trademark <laughs> on. I don't know if anyone would buy it. I don't know if anyone would buy it. But nonetheless, so so the government <laughs> shutdown is likely happening by the time you guys listen to this. We don't anticipate it lasting you know, maybe a week or two, but we'll, we'll see. We'll talk a lot more about it as we get into it. Um, so let's kind of shift gears on the YouTube channel. I am wearing the Facts versus Feelings T-shirt. Yes. Uh, we, we we broke these you out. Want, you want to move a little bit so that we see oh. the whole? Yeah. The, the, oh, there you go. Yeah. Is facts versus like Feelings. This? I like, I like it. it is. I yeah, like it. It's, yeah. So we got we, we, uh, some thanks for our, some of our um, pons, sponsors and partners helped us uh, with these. And they're a collector's item. There might be a chance on a future podcast where we're going to give some away. So just keep listening. If you want to get one of these, yes. you should keep listening. And speaking of podcasts and changes, Sonu, 
Uh, we just talked about this before we went live. Uh, I'm a, I'm maybe the only person who uses Google Podcasts. I'll admit I might You're be the, the only, only one. one I know. Yeah, yeah. We get the numbers on this, and trust me, most of you use iTunes and Spotify. I I, I know, I know, our um, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, but nonetheless, I got an email that Google Podcast is going away. So I will have to use something else. And we were talking. What, what do you use to listen to podcasts normally? Apple slash Spotify depends on you know which one I'm in. Uh, mm-hmm. You know. At, if, with the Apple thing, everything's at least nicely organized. But going back to Google, I mean, this is what mm-hmm. Google does. Google gives so much of stuff away for free, mm-hmm. right? And, and then at some point, they just sort of pull the rug from under you. Right? I, mean, <laughs> I, I, so, I mean, I remember back in the day, they had like this RSS reader and things like that. They pulled the plug yep. on that. It, and, you know, I'm just, well, I shouldn't say this. I'm not waiting for the day when they pull Gmail, but I mm. hope not. Oh, boy. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Yeah. So anyway, so if you use Go- if you're the other four be- four people out there besides myself to actually use Google Podcasts, I got some email. It's going to be a minute, you know, like this real ID thing. I've been going to airports like ten years. Well, the real ID is coming. You got to get a new ID. It's like you know, eventually it's going to um, happen. But anyway, it's just something to uh, be aware of. All right. So Soto, let's talk a little bit about the fourth quarter. The fourth quarter is upon us. Now, good riddance, I mean, to August yeah. and September. We don't exactly know where September is going to close, but at the time we're recording this, we're having a negative August and September. Just think about this, high level. Um, the fourth quarter is up 4.2% on average, higher about 80% of the time for the S&P back to 1950. Wow. The next best quarter is the first quarter up 2.1%. So you're talking double the average return. But here's where it gets even more interesting, Sonu, I think. When you have negative returns in August and, and September by at least 1% both of those months, so some decent selling in a seasonally weak period. Back to 1950, the fourth quarter has been higher 12 out of 13 times, up 7% percent on average with some really big gains in October final stat on this to think about when the S&P is up between 10 and 20 percent for the year going into the fourth quarter so I'm going to call that a pretty darn good year going into the fourth quarter fourth quarter is higher like 84 percent of the time so better more likely to be higher and up 5.1 percent on average so a stronger fourth quarter potential return now we are aware there's macro things to look at there's the fed there's inflation we talked about some of these things but just from a seasonal point of view uh, a strong start to a year normally means a strong fourth quarter as people kind of play catch up oh by the way fourth quarters for pre-election year tend to be pretty strong too so overall we do remain overweight at overweight equities we still think we're going to have a pretty good sized rally in the fourth quarter as negativity is starting to flow lots of things lots of dour talk of strikes shutdowns all no one saw expendables for i mean lots of negative <laughs> things are happening are happening out there including me i can't believe i haven't seen it yet it's just terrible um, i can't believe that yeah and i got better, I better hurry because it's not going to be in the theater as much, not going to be in the they theater as much longer yeah. pull the plug on that one by the yeah. sunday or oh something i don't know like I said, i'm thinking like you i hang out in chicago next week it'd be hilarious if you and i went and saw it together yeah find a way to do it anyway we we'll back back to back on task here um you know what do you think will be one of the drivers sonu of a potential fourth quarter rally we can't just say seasonals it's got to be a driver seasonals are you know that's that's the wick it's ready to be lit we just need to light it what can light a potential rally you think here so one thing is uh I mean, the economy has been strong. So it, the economy has been strong throughout. We've got really strong numbers, actually, July, August, September, right, uh, mm-hmm. across these last three months. So it, so that's sort of like, I don't want to say it's a given because a lot of people have underestimated the economy, right? But it, it's been strong and the markets have fallen, right? So the markets <laughs> do kind of do their own thing. Uh, the I think the Fed, when it becomes sort of clear that the Fed is probably done and looking ahead, Especially, look, the Fed is penciling in inflation about 3.7% by the end of this year. If inflation comes lower than that, let's say about, I know we'll talk about some of the numbers, but let's say inflation comes at 32 3.3% by core PC inflation, right, by the end of this year. Suddenly, the market's going to think, you know what? Inflation's running lower than what the Fed thinks. So we think yep. they're going to cut more than what even they've said in 2024, right? And now hmm. we're looking at 2024. I think that could spark a big rally, right? That could yeah. spark a big rally. The other thing, Ryan, I'm looking at, you and I have been talking about this, the dollar. Over yeah. the last three months, since July through September 27th, really, right? The dollar has rallied 7%. Mm-hmm. 
that's a big move for the largest currency mm-hmm. in the world, yeah. right? And I think that's weighed on, it's hard to say how these things are correlated, but I think safe to say it's weighed on markets, right? Nobody likes a stronger dollar, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's weighed on markets, I think. But since then, over the last, you know, three days of us recording this, the dollar has eased a bit. Mm-hmm. And I think if we continue to see the dollar ease or just stop going up, I think that's going to be a big positive. No, absolutely. Uh, you and I had the honor to join Chart Summit earlier this mm-hmm. week. Uh, JC Peretz, All Star Charts, put that together with a lot of smart people, and um, th- th- that conversation came up with a lot of smart technicians saying, "Listen, a dollar, it can go gently higher, but the trajectory that it's been, it's up, I believe, ten weeks in a row. I'm not sure what's going to happen wow. the week that we're t- recording this right now, but nonetheless, that's a pretty extreme move. And honest to goodness, if you would have told me ten weeks ago. The dollar would be up 10 weeks in a row. All this stuff happened. I don't think I honestly would have said, well, the S&P pulled back about 7%. I, I would have thought it would have been more than that, to be honest. I don't think I would have told you, you know what? Crude oil is going to have like its best quarter it's had like almost ever. Um, even gold. I mean, gold, yes, it struggled. But do this in quotations if you watch it on the YouTube channel. But honestly, I don't think gold, I don't, gold's held up really well in the face of a strong dollar, if you ask mm-hmm. me. So these are some, maybe some clues, some signs, right? What are the four most dangerous words? Sir John Templeton, this time is different. Well, this time is a little bit different because we had incredible yeah. dollar strength and commodities of honest to goodness held up pretty well. Now, so about four minutes ago, you're talking about the Fed. I had a terrible coughing attack on the YouTube channel. You get rewind and see it. I hit <laughs> mute. Hopefully you didn't hear me. You. Yeah, you, I heard the Fed. I just start coughing. I'm like, oh, not, not, not the F word again, the Fed, you know. So I had to hit mute there. Hopefully you didn't hear me. But I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling better now. Um, what do you think? I mean, commodities, you know, when we look at the portfolios we run for our more than 350 Carson partners, we, we've we liked energy. We've said on this very podcast yeah. for a while. It's probably our favorite group. Honestly, I wish we would have had more in energy. We've been overweight. We should have had more looking back um but we'll take it um you know, we've liked commodities too in some of our more tactical models right yep yeah we've liked commodities and energy and i think of it two ways one there's a positive economic story so mm-hmm. you know if the economy is growing energy is not going to fall off a cliff there's it's a very cyclical right. sector right and oil yeah. oil you know by definition in the sense there's more demand for oil right so there's that perspective and then i think about you know from a risk perspective as well like what's the if I, I mean, I know we talk about shutdowns, strikes, and you know, student loan repayment starts. And mm-hmm. I, for me, the biggest I wrote about this: the biggest risk for the economy is that we get an energy shock. Yeah. What does that do? That sends inflation higher. That sends gas prices higher. That means people have less money to spend on everything else in the economy. That spooks the Fed as well, right? And that's literally what happened. You know, we we've seen that movie before. We saw it in June of 2022, June of last year, right? What happened? Yeah. Uh, you know, the Fed got really spooked and they start they, instead of raising rates, 50 basis points, 0.5 percent, um, you know, at every meeting, they increase that to 0.75 percent. Right. 75 basis points. So I think I worry about an energy shock, but mm-hmm. that's also a risk factor for our portfolios. You think, OK, if there is one, hey, and if we have energy right. in the portfolios that should do well. Right. And, uh, you know, that's kind of ha- what happened over the last couple of years this year, energy lagged initially but it's rallied now so that's how i think about it oh exactly i mean last year energy was about the only group up right i mean you know, somewhere mm-hmm. about flat i think out of 11 groups energy was up significantly right over 50 yeah. percent now it made up a very small part of the s p 500 I and mean, you look at a 60 40 portfolio you start really slicing and dicing it's not like you know you're going to make much unless you had a decent overweight there but now we're starting right. to see uh some of that um you know speaking of the economy we're helping the economy in the dietrich household we got a new dog Mabel, oh, she's fun. uh, she's she's nineteen point she five pounds. Yeah, she's what she is, is she? Very there? cute. I've seen a picture. So, yeah. yeah, she's a she looks like a Dalmatian, but she's a Great Dane. And literally, as we do this, like from here to maybe four yards away, Walter, my one hundred and thirty pound Great Pyrenees. I'm looking at him right there. This dog has been on that dog has been listening to me on TV more than any dog. <laughs> most dogs in the world. He's literally just sitting right there as I do this podcast. He's a good wow. boy. He doesn't make any noise. But anyway, Mabel. So he's 130 pounds. Mabel's probably gonna be bigger than him. And believe me, I did not wow. want to get a big dog. My wife likes big things. She's got me. She's got these big dogs. She likes big <laughs> things, apparently. Um, so the bottom line though is yeah, we're helping the economy because every day I turn around, something new shows up from Amazon, Sonu. It's like here's a cage. Here's oh, this. Like here's that. Kids She's again. It, my, my, I mean, the, honest to God, my wife never listens to this podcast. We can talk about it for a minute here. Um, you know, <laughs> like like she our kids are old enough that they can just do their own thing. Like we could leave for a week and they'd probably still be alive. They might kill each other, but they'd still be alive <laughs> in theory. But now she's got a new baby, and this baby she takes oh. with her everywhere. And I'm like, don't take the dog to the game. Oh, the dog's at the game. So, but w- <laughs> once Mabel will be big enough that we can't do that forever. But she's a good little dog.
dog. She likes to bark, though. She's a little yippy thing, a puppy. You know? uh, Walter's so, kind of old and crotchety. He's kind of like, what are you doing to me here? You know, um, he growls at her a little. He's never bitter. He kind of snarls at her. He's giving her the, you know, just <laughs> leave me alone, right. youngster. Leave me alone. Sure. So, yeah. yeah anyway, so I went a little I rant there. Plate. Exactly. So, yes, yeah, so we're helping the economy that way. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about there, Sonu, on fourth quarter potential rally? What will lead us? Let's go let's back on what task I... here. What, go ahead. You want to ask something? Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to ask about small caps, right? We've seen yep. small caps yep. lag. And, and that's been – I've struggled with this a little bit or, you know, mm-hmm. thought about, like, what, wait, what's going on? But you think, look, if the economy is doing well, and even mm-hmm. the dollar, right? You think a dollar's, the dollar's strength should actually hurt, you know, the larger companies larger. who have a lot of international – revenues right because you know they earn in foreign currencies if foreign currencies are worth less than you know the u.s dollar that means those foreign profits are worth less too right so when they bring Mm -hmm. it back but so you think from that standpoint the economy doing well the dollar doing well small caps should be doing well but they haven't right so what's the story there how are you yeah. thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, a big part of small caps are regional banks. Regional banks have continued mm-hmm. to just kind of struggle. I mean, financials and financials are an interesting group because insurance has been doing a little bit better, but then you got regional banks not doing so well. It's kind of like healthcare where it's hard to pick like a certain or industrials. There's a lot of different parts in there. I think the, the weakness out of regional banks has not been helping small caps at all. But I, I will say this. I mean, you know, small caps are kind of a do or die area, right? At Chart Summit earlier this week, a lot of smart people were saying this is where small caps should bounce. This is where small caps should find some support some strength if they don't then we've got some some bigger problems and the three days to end the week at least as the middle of friday also we've seen some a pretty good size bounce out of small caps um so that's kind of where it is we still like small caps have a little bit of overweight there we've talked about that they have struggled the last month two months i guess you could say um but we're still optimistic that if you get a fourth quarter rally it can come a big part of that alpha outperformance can come from small caps and cyclicals in general we've like energy has done well but industrials are there too and you know there's some areas again i mean it's fascinating to me, not fasting is the right word, but just utilities. I mean, utilities are getting just obliterated. I mean, it, it, like yeah. down two and three percent, like every day it feels like. And again, similar and to these the dollar, are the defensive those are big stocks, moves, right? Right, those are defensive. I mean, if you look at pure technical analysis. The defensive stuff lagging is what you want to see. We've seen staples lag. We've seen utilities lag. Healthcare is kind of more mixed there. But those are the defensive areas. They're lagging. That's that's normal to see. And that's another reason, mm-hmm. I think, for a fourth quarter rally. We're seeing that also credit spreads. We've talked about these a lot. I don't want to get too in the weeds here. We're not seeing much stress at all in the credit markets. Okay, keep this simple. If there's a monster under the bed, the credit markets will be showing more stress. They're not showing any stress. So I think this weakness we've seen the last two months is more of a normal seasonal thing after the best start after seven months for the S&P 500 since 1997. Best first six months ever for the NASDAQ. We were due. We talked on this podcast. There were some well-known bears who came out and said, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My target. Oh, you know what? Now is like 2019. We heard that two months ago. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. Now now is like 2019 to these bears. We're due for a pullback. And sure enough, it's happened. Um, I don't think we're going to quite get to correction territory, which would be 10%. 4,200 on the S&P, depending on when you listen to this, is a pretty big level. 200 days down there, some previous support. It's a 38.2% retracement of the entire bull market. They're getting geeky on you, but sometimes you know this stuff can work. There's a lot of reasons to think 4,200 should should hold and we're not too far from there um at the time we're recording this so anything else on the fourth quarter before we talk about the final thing the economy no let's say good riddance to the third quarter that's it not from an economic standpoint but from a market's perspective which is what exactly exactly yeah i mean care about Yeah, it's I mean, you know, f- football's in the air and fall is here and you and I'll be hanging out in Chicago a couple times over the next uh, next yes. month or so. Hopefully fall goes well. So, yeah. Speaking of Chicago, we're going to do a little I'll let you do this because I know you were um, real excited about it. Give us a little promo of episode 55 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings. Who did we have besides you and I? They're sick of us talking. And this guy talked a lot, by the way. Yes. Who's on next week's podcast? Captain Quant. Right, <laughs> like I think that's why I think I captured a good one. No, good. Cl- Cliff Asnes from AQR. I mean, goodness, uh, it was an honor to have uh, Cliff. If if you've done any sort of quantitative work in this business, right, in investing, but I, I don't get technicals, you know, uh, other kind of factors stuff. We won't get into what all those things are. Yeah. Cliff is the one you look up to, right. And the amazing thing is, look, he runs a you know firm that manages billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, and he's still doing a lot of work. He still does a lot of research. He still does a lot of writing. So in a way, you know, sort of look up to him in terms of, 
you know, oh, oh good. I, I wish I could produce stuff like that, produce research mm-hmm. like that, right? So he's amazing to talk to. And I think what he does well is he combines, he does, he, what he does well is combine research with practical application. How do you exactly. take that research and, you know, use it to help your clients and advisors and things like that? So definitely tune in for that. No, it was it was great. I mean, and the other thing he's doing, he's traveling a ton. He was a future proof uh, the week that yes. we recorded our thing with him in Nashville. So he's traveling the country, going to events, giving podcasts, giving presentations. And he's hilarious. I think that's the thing. Yes, you look at like funny. Warren Buffett and some of these really famous investors that, that, that understand investing. They're also famous because they can explain it because they're relatable. Yes. Um, and Cliff is. I mean, I, I joked. I, we asked like the first question. I don't even know what I asked the guy. I asked him something, <laughs> and he talked for like ten minutes. And he was like so far from where we first asked. But Soto, you yeah. and I were just like, it was just awesome. Yeah. It was like, like, like just just keep talking. I mean, it was a great podcast. I yes. think you're really, really going to love it. We go sure. a bunch of different, some hockey talk, and there's a lot of different things in there. Yes. Um, we talked to Cliff Astis last week that, or I'm sorry, recently at, at Excel uh, that we'll play recorded for you next week on episode 55 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings. But as we wind down on this one, so do you have a you've got a meeting in 11 minutes, and we're, so we'll, we'll try to wrap this up in five minutes here. Right. Some sure. economic data just came out. On Friday, you and I are again recording this on Friday, a few hours after the data. The PCE, they tell us, you can say what it is in a second, they tell us it's the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. What did you see when you looked at the personal consumption expenditures there? Right. So there are bad PCE reports. You, you and I have seen those, you know, recently, especially mm-hmm. over the last year. There are okay ones. There are Goldilocks ones, as we call it. Yeah. You know, oh, this is like the best possible one with respect to Fed and markets. And then yep. there are really good ones, right? This one was a really good PC report. And the big takeaway is that, look, core inflation slowing across the board, even if you look under the hood at different components, that's slowing down, which means what the, we talked about, the Fed is unlikely mm-hmm. to hike any further, right? right? At the same time, the economy is strong. We got income and consumption data that shows that the consumer is healthy, and that's good for the economy that's reliant, what, 68, 70% on consumption, right? Mm-hmm. And just getting into the numbers, like headline inflation was up 0.4% in August, right? And uh, right now it's running over the last three months at an annualized pace about 3.1%, right? But here's why that number is important. Employee compensation, right? You're talking about incomes across all workers in the economy. That's running over the last three months at 5.6%. So incomes at rising at 5.6%, inflation running at 3.1%. There's a difference there, right? About two and a half percent. That's real income growth for workers across the economy. What is that? What comes to mind? Obviously, consumption should be strong. And that's what we saw. Consumption over the last three months, up 7%, Ryan. 7% annualized growth for consumption. By the way, for all those people saying, oh, student loans are going to crash the economy. Let me tell you, over the first six months of the year, student loan payments averaged about $1 billion a month before the pandemic, I think it was about $6 billion a month. Mm-hmm. So like you think, oh, if one goes to six, when payments restart, that's going to take a hit from consumption, right? But turns out after the Supreme Court, you know, uh, struck down the Biden administration's uh, program to cancel student loans, all of that, that was at the end of June. What a lot of stu- borrowers said, you know what, payments are going to restart in October. Let me just start paying now. So in July, right. payments rose from one to two, two and a half billion. And in August, it exploded higher student loan payments came in at more than uh, close to six and a half billion dollars and september is running strong too by the way through this all go back consumption running close to seven percent annualized so that in and of itself in and of itself should tell you that look consumption strong student loan payment restarts are not going to hit it right then the, going back to inflation the best news i think core inflation i said that over the last three months it's running at 2.2 percent that's a two handle over the last three months. Last month, it was up 0.1% month over month in August. I mean, that can be revised, all of that. That's why it's nice to look at the last three months, right? Three months, 2.2%, Ryan. I mean, you know, that that's it was as high as 6% a year ago, right? So we've come a long way. Core inflation slowing. I think that's a big takeaway. No, that that, that is. I mean, if 2.2% is inflation and wages are growing faster than that, that is 
That is real wages, right? People are making more yeah. than inflation. I mean, we don't hear about that on TV every time I listen. They keep talking about everything else that's out there. I mean, I did fill up my tank the other day, and I joked. You know, I've never cra- quite cracked 80. It was like 79, 80. I was like, ooh, is this going to be the one? But So people are paying more at the pump, we're, we're aware. Um, but still, wages are strong, and there are other areas that have come back um, when you look at inflation. So those are those are good things. Now, so one other thing, maybe to finish with, because we hear a lot about this where the bottom 50% are in a really rough spot. All the gains are the top 1%, top 10%, because they own equities and they own big houses and things like that, which is which is true. But you did some incredible work, I thought, where you looked at the bottom 50% of all income, um, income earners. Their net wealth this decade, so since 2020, has exploded higher relative to the top 1% in 10% that we hear so much about yeah. uh, collecting all the net wealth. You want to dig in on that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, how much time do they have? Half an hour now? <laughs> <laughs> two yeah. minutes. I'll, I'll take two minutes. You can tie me. There look, you uh, if you look at net worth, right, and separate this by, you know, how much wealth uh, households own. So the bottom 50% in terms of, you know, uh, how much of wealth they own across the economy, their net worth has gone up 74% over the last three and a half years, right? Whereas mm-hmm. for, you know, uh, the wealth group 50th to 90th percentile, that's up just above 30%. Same thing from 90th to 99th percent, about 30%. And even for the top 1%, right, by wealth, uh, their net worth over the last three and a half years, that's up 35%. Whereas the bottom 50% is up 74%, right? That's huge. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I don't want to minimize the fact that there's a lot of inequality. As a share of overall net worth, that's still low, right? It, it's still about 2.5%, the share of net uh, total net worth that the bottom mm-hmm. 50% has. But that at the end of 2019, by the way, Ryan, that was 1.9%. So it's going up, it's going in the right direction. Right. Could it, ideally it'll go up even more. But it just tells you this economy is working different from what yeah. we experienced over the last two decades. Right. From 2007 to 2019. Remember, we had the great financial crisis, but housing crashed. And normally for the bottom 50 percent, housing matters a lot because real estate is a big part of their assets. Right. right. If housing crashes, their net worth goes down over the 13 years from 12, 2007 to 2019. Net worth for the bottom 50 percent was up less than 40 percent. Over the last three and a half years, going back to the number, it's up 74%, right? So that's huge. It's a big change in how this economy is working. And I think that's partly why it's kind of surprising everyone. No, absolutely. And again, the consumer still remains strong. Right? One of the reasons we came into this year saying there likely would not be a recession and people hated that call. Yeah. They're angry. When we looked at the data, you look at the data and said, listen, the consumer is still pretty strong. Sure. Housing's not great. Manufacturing is not great, but the consumer is strong. We're still seeing that um, at this time. So, so no, yeah, we've hit the end of the road here. Um, you know, this was fun to get back and do one of these, you know, yes. um, we get next week off, but you and I get to hang out in Chicago, which will be a lot of fun. So with all that, everyone, this is episode 54 of Carson's Facts versus Feelings titled Welcome to the Fourth Quarter. We had a lot of fun talking about it and definitely check out next week's when we bring on Cliff from AQR. You're going to love that one. Um, with all that, though, everyone, have a great, um, great October. My goodness gracious. It's October by the time people listen to this. Um, when's your birthday? Your birthday's October, right? Or when's your birthday? Oh, no. Or, my, or... my kid's birthday is October 10th. So okay. I, I'm a... I, I'm a Star Wars birthday person, May fourth. Oh, May the 4th, that's right. I knew you're. That's right. I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm October 28th, which historically is I like know. the most bullish day of the year. So the best day of the year. Yeah, right? for stocks oh. at least. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. It is the best day of the year, period. Uh, I can't make guarantees. <laughs> I can't make guarantees. But uh, for stocks, it's one of the stronger days. Anyway, with all that, everybody, thanks. Um, so no, we'll chat soon, I'm sure. And we'll see everyone next time. Thank you. Take care. Information provided on Facts versus Feeling with some of our geese and Ryan Dietrich are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. The statements and opinions of show guests may not be reflected of CWM LLC or its affiliates. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principle. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Facts versus Feelings are not affiliated with CWM LLC.